Okay, great. Well, hi everybody. Um, thanks to the organizers for having me here. Thank you for attending. I'm gonna share with you work about watching people and images and video in order to enhance the way we can train agents, meaning embodied agents or augmented reality systems. So in broad strokes, how do embodied agents learn today? They do so through firsthand experience, so trying things, acting in the world and seeing the results. They also can augment their learning with human input, often with demonstrations. So maybe a kinesthetic demonstration where someone shows the robot exactly the states and actions it needs to achieve to do a task. Now vision, of course, is also a very big part of today's robots, um, but largely is being used for sensing and measuring the agent's surroundings. What if instead we turn this sensing towards action? And what if we look at what can be learned by watching people? So here I'm showing you an egocentric video from a person walking around a mall. And as we watch such data, we can start to get glimpses of how people move in the environment, how they direct their attention over time, how they interact with other people in the scene, and also how they interact with objects from how they reach for them, touch them, grasp them, and use them. Now, uh, what we'd like to see is this kind, these kind of lessons or insights from such video translate to the way we can train our embodied agents. And again, this could be for manipulating, navigating agents, or an augmented reality system. So that is our mission here. And the talk today is about people watching for agent learning, where we wanna to move towards into more intelligent embodied agents that learn by watching how people interact with three things, the environment, objects, and people. And in fact, this is how I'll organize the remainder of the talk to these three components with ideas for how we're starting to uh, explore how to capture people in video and images in order to help our understanding of interactions, environments, objects, and people. So let's start with environments. So to set the stage a bit further, we know there's this contrast with traditional third-person video, like you see here, and egocentric video. In third-person video, we are a spectator watching something in front of us. And this makes very relevant questions like what and where. What is the object? Where's the person? What are they doing? However, when we turn to egocentric data, the interactions with the environment are coming to the forefront. We see the world, as Voltaire was describing in the intro, we see the world through the eyes of this camera where, and these interactions are really important. So now the questions are not just what and where, but how and what would happen. So questions like what would this person do next? What areas in this environment are important for the activities they're doing? How do they use the space? Where and how could you use some object? So these are the kind of very exciting questions we get to tackle in this space. And in particular, for environments, we're interested in modeling the space physically. So how do we map it? So here I'm showing you some top-down view of an 3D environment. And the traditional way to map it would be SLAM, so to build a metric map, either in 2D or 3D. Uh, however, what we're proposing in the work I'm about to show is to instead think about mapping in terms of human-centric functionality. So our goal is to map a space by its functionality so that we understand it not just as measurements of what's there, but as possibilities for action. And we think that egocentric video offers exactly the kind of data that would allow us to learn this functionally based map. And so in this work that we're presenting at the main conference called EgoTopo, rather than encode video simply as a stack of frames that we could push through some 3D convolutions, instead we propose to model it as a topological graph. And this is a graph in which the video clips are organized into nodes based on their activity coherence. And then each of those nodes will encode the visits that the agent, here a human wearing the camera, has made to those locations and the, the, the activities that they did there. Okay, so I'm gonna show you how to build this graph and also why it's so useful. So this egocentric or egotopo graph is a structured video representation. And again, we find it as something of a hybrid between the pure video approach of looking at frames over time versus the pure SLAM or 3D approach that thinks only of the measurable space. And it's 
truly defined by how a human navigates and uses the space. And this will allow two things. I'm gonna show you how in this talk, two things we can do. One is it allows reasoning about first person behavior. For example, we may learn from these videos in this space that a person gets a vegetable, tends to go to cut it, and then goes to the sink to wash, or to go to the sink and wash it. Furthermore, the second key thing we'll reveal is the environment affordances, meaning what kind of actions can be done where. Okay, and I'm gonna show you that after I define the method a bit more. So the ego topo graph construction process first starts by training a localization network. And this is a network that's gonna look at frames from the video and decide if they belong in the same node, meaning they're similar enough. And this is based on both standard things like visual similarity or consistent geometry, but also human-centric factors, like the fact that frames that are temporally adjacent are more likely attributable to a similar action or within a clip if we're viewing similar distributions of actions or objects. This gives a higher level way to link the nodes. Now with this localization network, we can now sequentially process through the egocentric video to assign frames and clips to nodes. And this process is simply to ask this localization network whether the incoming frame is similar enough to an existing node or not. And if it is not, a new node is created. And if it is, it gets added to that existing node. Okay, so we're going through the board in the video in order to discover these coherent action-based nodes. Now, uh, this is a video showing an example of ego topograph being constructed from uh, Epic Kitchen's video. You can see these nodes dynamically popping up as new activity zones are encountered. Now, I said there's two things we want to do with this ego topo representation. And the first is anticipation. So we're interested in knowing not just what we see happening in front of us now in time, but anticipating what is likely to happen in the future. In contrast to recent work looking at anticipation at the very near term scale, time scale, like one second forward, here we're exploring it for a long term video in which the task is to view the video up to some fraction and then predict the future actions that will occur till the end. And that time span in the future can be anywhere from five to 45 minutes, for example, in the Epic Kitchens data set. Now this task is gonna succeed if we have a good encoding of both what parts of the activity have already happened and what would be required to complete them. And the ego topograph is gonna give us a leg up in order to get that encoding. So to add on to the method I've described so far to tackle this anticipation task, we'll describe each node with a node level representation that is learned based on those clips associated with the node. And then we'll build a graph convolutional neural network on top of those node representations in order to capture that topology where nodes are linked based on their temporal proximity in the original video. And then we'll train this GCN for the action anticipation task. When we do this, we get results like you see here. And we're testing on Epic on the left, as well as the Georgia Tech Kitchens data set on the right. And these are accuracy measures for um, the anticipation task, higher is better. And what we're comparing to at the top are so-called pure video methods, meaning those that really treat the video as a volume of frames. And below that, those that add more sophisticated structure to the video encoding, but in ways different than Ego Topo. And we can see that there is a, a bump, a consistent one, particularly over the pure video and even over those more complex aggregation schemes by using this topological graph. Okay, so that was anticipation. The other key task I wanted to show for Ego Topo is to infer the environment affordances. And this is where you need to look at a space as an agent or as an augmented reality system and understand what interactions are possible. Not just the ones we see, but what could be done right there. So again, when we learn from this video, we'll see some subset of possible actions. Like here, maybe we've witnessed the person turn on the stove, when in fact, there's an array of other things that would be legitimate to happen here. So here's our next idea for Ego Topo. To augment the model further, we propose to link the nodes across different environments. 
So I'll only see so many things happen in this one particular kitchen at the stove, but I'll see other things happen at another stove in another kitchen. And so based on node level functionality, distribution of objects, distribution of actions, we'll associate nodes from kitchen to kitchen and build what we call a consolidated ego topo graph. Now what this does in practice then is to augment the available training data, because now we've witnessed an, a broader set of activities that we can attribute to these kind of activity zones. And with those, we propagate the labels across from the different data, different videos, different kitchens, in order to have a richer affordance training model. Okay, so that brings us then to the ability to look at a, a video clip and identify the most likely actions that could happen there. Again, whether or not they're happening right now. For example, on the right-hand side, this is a, uh, a node in which it's very likely we think that there'll be a fill of a cup or pouring water, but less likely that someone would be mixing stock. Now, getting these kind of environment affordances is a very important part of this, this goal here, right? Because we wanted to move from not thinking of the video as pure video, in which there's no spatial context at all, and also not thinking of it as pure 3D, in which there's no activity context at all, to now this topological encoding in which the human-centric behavior is at the forefront of what even emerges to be part of this encoding. So when we test the second task of environment affordances, we get accuracy like you see here, same two data sets as before, and now baselines that do things that propagate labels either based on SLAM, meaning attributing to spatial positions in the world, or visual similarity. And in short, we can get consistently more robust affordance predictions with this proposed model. So this is the ego topo approach. And if for exam visual exam uh, visualizations like the one I'm showing here, you can look to the project webpage where we're decomposing the spaces into how people use them and understanding what will be possible where. Now, building on this and ongoing work, we are looking at how this visual affordance model can benefit an agent who's acting in the world. Okay, so remember, people watching for agent learning. So to, in this case, what we're interested in is being able to have an agent, like here, one shown in the AI Thor environment, be able to come in and quickly discover all the ways in which it can use the space. So imagine this robot has no idea about what its actions mean yet. It was just spawned into this world. Doesn't know what actions mean, doesn't know the space yet, hasn't been in this environment, but should be able to move around quickly and get the lay of the land. Our idea is to inject these visual affordances into this problem. And I'll show you next an example of doing so. This is a video result. Here are um, model running in AI Thor. And the agent has experienced different actions in this world, and it starts to build up its own visual affordance model. And on the left, it's color coded by what affordances that it predicts. Like it thinks the blue things are toggleable, the greens are placeable, the pinks are openable. And on the right, we're looking at the top down view of that agent with the white curve as his trajectory over time. Now there's green dots and yellow dots on the right hand side. Yellow dots represent places at which the agent tried to execute an action, but it failed. For example, maybe it tried to cut a bowl. And then the green dots are places where it tried to execute an action and it succeeded. So maybe it tried to cut a loaf of bread. And what the whole point of this um, problem here is to get as many green dots as we can in as little time as we can and minimize the number of failed actions. And this will amount to an agent entering this world and um, executing everything that's possible to get to know this new environment. And the key is that we can do this quickly. We have a deep reinforcement learning approach to, to learn and encourage this kind of behavior through the visual affordances. All right, so next, uh, in the remainder of the talk, I'll speak more briefly about the way we're learning by watching people for the sake of objects and manipulation, as well as understanding people and in interaction. So now let's look at objects. Okay, so very consistent with what I've been talking about so far, where we want to look at things not just as things to name, um, but as things to use. Here in the case of objects, this goes from the environment level down to the level of how would I touch this object? Where could I toggle it? Could I adjust it here? Where would I grasp it to pick it up? Okay, so this is of object level affordances. 
Uh, now, to study this, current methods typically use supervised learning. You can imagine training a semantic segmentation model that can look at an image and predict labels and spatial regions where actions are possible. This is done by manually uh, having people manually label images for different actions, like here's where I can hold a book, here's where I would pick up a cup, and so on. Now this is expensive, but more importantly, it only captures an annotator's expectation of what is important or how they do things. So it's, there's an indirection here that we'd like to overcome. And we think a good way to overcome it is to, again, turn to video, whether egocentric or third person, to learn how people are using objects, such that we can convert this kind of understanding to models that will help agent-based learning. So let me say a bit about how this approach works. And this is our approach called Interaction Hotspots, presented recently at ICCB. We take a video stream during training that's weekly supervised according to the action present. So this one, for example, contains an instance of opening. We'll train a sequential model, this LSTM, to do action recognition among these weekly labeled data. And now the key part is that we'll simultaneously train a model that knows how to look at an inactive object, like the closed microwave on the top left, and anticipate what would be the feature space state of this object were we to observe the given action here open. Okay, so it's a model that not only knows how to recognize an action when it's happening, but is also trained to convert inactive objects to this latent space of what they look like when used. And so this will be key to allow us to look at things that aren't being used yet, but see them through the eye of what we could be doing. Okay, so that model then we expand in order to get spatially localized maps by a class activation mapping process. Well, we'll push back in this same network and for every given verb we know, pull, press, we'll be able to find those spatial regions that are most responsible for that anticipation network's decision about the possible action. So we could do this here, create the heat map you see for pullable, do the same thing for another verb like pressable and get a different heat map. So in, in effect, what you have is a model looks at a image or frame of an object at rest, and for a series of actions, understands where those actions would be likely to happen. Now we've tested this on two data sets. On the left, a data set from Stanford of YouTube product demonstrations, and on the right, the Epic Kitchens data set. And what was key in testing in both cases was to consider generalization, not just to new instances, but even to new categories of objects. And the idea is you want an agent that can come into a space and even if it hasn't met this particular appliance yet, could still have an idea of its likely functionality and how it would interact to achieve that functionality. So here are some examples of what you get with our hotspots model. The colors represent different, affordan different affordances. So here green is mixable. And I'm showing just the most frequent verbs um, at the bottom here, but these are from Epic Kitchens. There's some tens of other verbs that are also being learned for affordance. Here, washable is prominent, both the thing in the sink, but also that knife sitting to the side that looks ready to be washed. Here, the jars to the top right looked openable, colored in cyan. This door handle looks openable before the person gets there. And finally, in this case, I'm showing you on the right, our model on the left, traditional saliency. And you see the big distinction is we're not just finding things that look interesting, we're finding things and decoding them for the agent in terms of what actions will be possible and where. And again, egocentric video really gives us that firsthand experience in, uh, in order to learn this. Now, when we evaluate these heat maps against ground truth, we get good results, including very strong results against any other weekly supervised method attempting the task shown in the top of this chart, as well as even approaching those that are strongly supervised with manual uh, labels. Okay, so I've talked about how we could take video, weekly labeled for action, and learn how to use objects in the sense of highlighting those regions where different actions are possible. In ongoing work, we're showing, we're considering how we can translate this kind of visual affordance learning that's object-centric 
two embodied agents. And we're looking at uh, a dexterous hand. Now this hand is challenging to learn policies for because of the high degrees of freedom, 30 degrees of freedom in this instance. And so what we would like to achieve is this expectation of how people use objects, as well as the agreement between the morphology of this dexterous hand and the human hand in order to shortcut that learning process in order to accelerate how the agent can learn because it knows the right places to even attempt a grasp. And so we've built a pipeline kind of um, that's summarized very briefly here on the bottom where the agent looks at the object in front of it, anticipates the affordances based on visual processing, and then has a policy that's rewarding actions that bring the hand to those afforded regions. And so for time, I won't go into details of the model in this talk, what we've been able to show is that this leads to faster learning, better grasping, and most importantly, generalization to new objects. Because if you think about it, a traditional demonstration where a human needs to show the states and actions that which should be reached to accomplish this grasping task would be very much tied to the kind of object that was there for the demonstration. Whereas with a visual model, as we're proposing, the new instance itself can be mapped directly to these useful regions, whether we've seen that literal object or not. So here I'll show you some teaser videos for the, the method at work. We call it graph for grasp affordances. Here's early in its learning process for six different objects where it's fumbling around, you know, trying to figure out how do I pick this thing off the table. Now more iterations of learning go by and it's starting to get pretty good at finding the place to grasp. And you'll notice that many of these grasses, grasps are not just getting it off the table, but choosing to grasp in a functional way. Okay. And now a result comparing on the bottom right, the method I was just describing that we developed, graph, as well as at the top, two other pure RL approaches to learn grasping behavior that on the left either have no prior or on the right have a prior to go towards the object center of mass. On the bottom left, we have a traditional RL model augmented with imitation learning, which can also accelerate learning, but as I said, requires these state action demonstrations. And we see that um, pretty exciting, I think, demonstration here of the, uh, the agent being able to find new objects and still understand how to interact with them, thanks to this visual affordance learning. Okay, so in the last couple minutes, I will talk briefly about this final piece in our work where we're looking at these interactions with people. And here we're interested in body pose. Not the body pose we see in the camera, but the body pose of the person wearing the camera. So here you can see an egocentric chest mounted camera on the left, the video. What we wanna come back with is the 3D pose of that person on the right. And though you can't see much of the body, we've shown in prior work that this is possible because of the structure and the motion of the camera itself, as well as how the surroundings change as a function of a person's body pose. Now more recently, and in work we'll present at the main conference this week, we are expanding this work to count for interactions. And particularly with a so-called second person, the person that the camera wear is interacting with. And the key insight is this, we know that our uh, body postures are very much linked to those around us. So in all these images, I suppose that you may be able to guess the body pose of the person I'm hiding, because they are interacting with or even touching another person. For example, on the left, you might have expected that this person's reaching to shake a hand or in the middle, that they're looking to where the person's pointing. This is what we wanna leverage and we've built a video model that will take egocentric video stream, so what the camera wear sees, extract the second person's pose and learn from this video together with those second person poses to extract the hidden first person pose. Okay, and in short, because these dyadic interactions have these links over time, using that other person's pose is a strong hint about what my own pose behind the camera may be. And here's an example result from the method. Um, again, this is the egocentric video. Someone else is there. The person behind the camera is the pose we wanna estimate. And our result is shown on the right-hand video. And in these kind of interactions, ranging from games to more just conversational gestures, we have shown quantitatively in the paper, what a difference being able to pay attention to this other person's pose will make for results. 
All right, so this is my talk today. I've shown you our current work on people watching for agent learning. And the key elements were the following. One, environment affordances from video through this topological encoding called Ego Topo. Two, object interaction hotspots learned from Ego Video. Three, translating these kind of visual affordances to exploration as well as dexterous grasping. And finally, this uh, idea for you to me pose estimation based on person-to-person -person interactions. And this is work done with everyone you see here, Tushar, Yang Hao, Christoph, Bianca, Yvonne, Dong Lai, and Han Yul. So I'll stop here and we'll be very happy to have any comments or questions. Thank you for the great talk, Kristen. Uh, I think we've got a few questions in the chat. So uh, Victor asks, Victor says, thanks a lot for the interesting work. Could you please share more insights on how to scale affordances? Should we collect annotations? If so, how? Or make them self-supervised? Yeah, so how to scale affordances? We think that this video-based approach is a, a way in that direction. And the reason is we're not, there's no spatial annotation happening. And I was, we were more concerned about the kind of information gap between doing this by hand, but there is of course the cost gap and scaling concern if we have to keep annotating for new, uh, more images for new objects. Learning from video is more weak in supervision. Furthermore, if we concentrate efforts on this ability to generalize, so we wanna of course understand objects based on the, the latent factors that cause their use, not just their object identity. And the kind of experiments we're running where we do kind of test on unseen objects is one way to push the, our progress in that direction. Okay, thank you. Um, kind of a follow-up to that, someone is asking, I'm wondering how other modalities such as gaze can help to learn affordance. Yeah, I think gaze is a great one. And in our data, not available, but um, would be, you know, having true gaze measurements with this data would be extremely powerful, I think, for understanding the object use. Of course, you can predict the gaze as well. And we have some baselines in these experiments where, you know, if you took the video and had a supervised model to train for gaze, you know, what, where would that put your hotspots? Um, and there is, of course, there is a, a gap between where the object grass points are and where the gaze is. And I think that's why you saw the difference in those results. Yeah, but absolutely, in short, I think having data like this with gaze would be right in line with what we're trying to learn here. Great. Um, one more question about the you to me work. Um, Raja is wondering if both pe people wore cameras, this would lead to additional ver validations of dyadic interactions. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. So in our case, only the camera wearer is wearing the camera, the video which we're processing. The second person is not. Um, and we see this as a bonus for being lightweight, right? If we just assume I'm wearing a camera, but I don't assume everyone else is. However, there is also nice work from Yoichi Sato, who's giving a talk later today on the case where you have the multiple cameras and you care about this back and forth interaction. Great, and one final quick question. Uh, Megmi asks, can the robot generalize to grasp new tools? Yes, indeed it has. Um, you know, with the caveat that you saw the imagery we're doing in this robot simulator, it's um, 3D meshes that have, you know, more simple backgrounds right now, but, you know, we've trained on things like hammers and then it can generalize to an ax. So we've done this by training on um, objects from what the contact DB data set and then taking meshes from outside categories that are um, still visually related enough that the affordances are predictable. Great. Thank you very much again. Um, I think